America has a Lincoln problem. The problem is that Abraham Lincoln long ago became the image of America, but it's a false image invented more than 150 years ago by the Republican Party propaganda machine and its court historian supporters. Ever since then, this false image has been the official excuse or justification for a highly centralized government that has too often been aggressive abroad and despotic at home, just as General Robert E. Lee predicted in his famous post-war letter to the British historian, Lord Acton. Now, in his book, The Legacy of the Civil War, Robert Penn Warren wrote of how this false image of Lincoln created a, quote, treasury of virtue in the hands of the American state that, quote, justified anything and everything the state did and would do in the future, no matter how despotic. The 19th century war of genocide against the Plains Indians right after the uh, war to prevent Southern independence, the massacre of some 200,000 Filipinos for resisting the conquest and occupation of their country, the imperialistic Spanish-American War, the foolish and disastrous American entry into World War I, and countless other acts of imperialism and despotism are all said to be virtuous by definition, no questions allowed. The real Lincoln, including his words and actions, must be forgotten, and a phony history of the man must be concocted in order to pull off this intergenerational government propaganda crusade. And what a fine job the court historians, Lincoln scholars, have done with this. Today, the average American knows next to nothing about Lincoln apart from the few slogans we're all taught in elementary school, along with an avalanche of myths and superstitions. Even the slogans are fake, however. He freed the slaves, we're taught, even though his Emancipation Proclamation only applied to, quote, rebel territory, end quote, where no slave could have been freed. It specifically exempted West Virginia, the last slave state to enter the Union during the Lincoln regime, and the parishes of Louisiana that were at the time under our Union Army occupation, again, where slaves could have been freed. And it was defined as a war measure that would have ended immediately if the South re-entered the Union. He worked mightily to get the 13th Amendment passed that did end slavery, we are told. But this too is contradicted by the preeminent Lincoln scholar of the last generation, Pulitzer Prize winning historian David Donald of Harvard. In his biography of Lincoln, David Donald wrote that not only did Lincoln barely lift a finger to get the amendment passed, he refused to help the radical Republicans procure votes for the amendment from the New Jersey delegation when they asked him for his assistance. Lincoln saved the Union, we are told. Exactly the opposite of the truth. The Union of the Founding Fathers was a voluntary union of the free, independent, and sovereign states. Post-1865 American Union was a coerced union held together by military force, much more like the Soviet Union. Lincoln's war destroyed the voluntary union of the Founding Fathers, he did not save it. Americans are also taught that Lincoln launched an invasion of his own country. Keep in mind, he never admitted that secession was legitimate in order to free the slaves. But Lincoln himself and the U.S. Congress adamantly denied it. In his first inaugural address, he pledged that he had no intention whatsoever to do anything about slavery except for supporting the Corwin Amendment to the Constitution, which had just passed the House and Senate and which would have prohibited the federal government from ever interfering with Southern slavery. I call it Lincoln's slavery forever speech. The War Aims Resolution of the U.S. Congress broadcast to the world that the purpose of the war was to save the Union and not to interfere with, quote, the domestic institutions, end quote, of the states, such as slavery. We are supposed to believe that Lincoln was a champion of racial equality, who believed that all men are created equal. But this too is exactly the opposite of the real Lincoln as the collected works of Abraham Lincoln proves. There you will find him saying such things as, and these are in quotations, what I would most desire would be the separation of the white and black races, he said. And I, as much as Judge Douglas, am in favor of the race to which I belong having the superior position. I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races, said Lincoln. I will to the very last stand, he said, by the law of this state, which forbids the marrying of white people with Negroes. And Senator Douglas remarked that this government was made for the white people and not for Negroes. Why, in point of mere fact, I think so too, said Lincoln. He made many uh, similar pronouncements. Lincoln was also a lifelong advocate of colonization or the deportation of black people. 
He was a manager of the Illinois Colonization Society that used tax dollars to deport a small number of free blacks from the state, funded a colonization effort while president, and was plotting to deport the freed slaves up to his dying day, as documented by the scholarly book, Colonization After Emancipation, by Philip Magnus and Sebastian Page. Lincoln waged total war on the southern states to preserve constitutional government in America, we are told. We can only believe this if we ignore Article 3, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution that defines treason as, quote, levying war upon the United States or giving aid and comfort to their enemies. The word there means the states are referred to in the plural as in the free and independent states. Lincoln's invasion of the South was therefore the exact definition of treason in the United States Constitution. Meanwhile, he redefined treason to mean any criticism of himself and his administration. We're supposed to believe that, quote, preserving the Constitution includes such acts of the Lincoln administration as the illegal suspension of the writ of habeas corpus and the mass imprisonment of tens of thousands of northern state critics of the Lincoln administration, the shutting down of hundreds of opposition newspapers in the North, the deportation of Democratic Congressman Clement Vallandigham of Ohio, Lincoln's harshest congressional critic, the issuing of an arrest warrant for the Chief Justice of the United States for the crime of saying that his suspension of habeas corpus was unconstitutional, the constitution of firearms in the border states and a general abolition of civil liberties. We are told that Lincoln was a great statesman when in reality he plunged the nation into the bloodiest war in American history with as many as 850,000 war-related deaths according to the latest research and all over tax collection. Yes, tax collection. After cementing in place his ironclad support for Southern slavery, including vigorous enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act in his first inaugural address, Lincoln threatened, in his words, invasion and bloodshed in any state that refused to collect the federal tariff on imports, the rate of which had been more than doubled two days earlier. He, of course, kept his word when the South refused to be plundered by protectionism. Abe Lincoln was a great humanitarian as well, the court historians assure us. But a great humanitarian would not have waged total war on the civilian population of his own country, causing the death of at least 50,000 of them. A great humanitarian would not reward military generals who oversaw the pillaging, plundering, and burning of vast regions of his country in violation of international law and of any civilized person's concept of basic morality. A great humanitarian would not be obsessed with developing larger and larger weapons of mass destruction to be used on his own country's citizens. A great humanitarian would not order daily firing squads for young military conscripts who attempted to escape their forced participation in all of this, as Lincoln did. These facts about the real Lincoln are just a few of the reasons why, as historian Larry Tagg wrote in his book, The Unpopular Mr. Lincoln, the 16th president was by far the most hated and reviled of all American presidents during his lifetime. That was the opinion of virtually all who knew him or knew of him. For at least the past century and a half, Americans have been indoctrinated with a fake Wizard of Oz version of the man. The deification of Lincoln led to the deification of the presidency in general, and then to the federal government itself, not at all different from the kind of lies, myths, and superstitions that were used to solidify the powers of the Roman emperors and other tyrants throughout world history.